Last weekend, I was at Orchestra Hall. The printed program included a four-page insert that told the story behind one of the pieces. It was the world premiere of Finnish composer, conductor, and violinist Jaco Kusisto's symphony, a commissioned piece, his final work, which he was in the process of composing when he died on February 23rd of this year at just 48 years of age. At the time of his death, the symphony was just partially completed, six minutes of the first movement, four of the second, for a total of 40 measures. In the short three months between his death and the premiere this past weekend, Yako's younger brother, also a composer, conductor, and violinist, completed the symphony, ensuring that the bits written by him sounded as though they could have been written by Yako. The program notes explained. There's not a single theme or melody in the completed symphony that is not derived from Yako's already existing compositions. Before the orchestra performed the piece, Yako's brother, who was present, spoke to the audience. He was tender with grief as he lovingly and proudly remembered his brother. His remarks were brief, as one might expect after such a loss and after honoring his brother by completing his final work. One could say, there just are no words. He concluded by saying, and now, I am going to sit behind the second violins so that I can listen to the symphony from inside the orchestra. This past Tuesday, our staff here at St. Philip the Deacon spent half a day in retreat. We worshiped together, we shared a meal, we did some community building, and we played handbells. You might know that because of a generous donation recently, we were able to purchase a set of handbells. And just this spring, our newly formed bell choir under the direction of our organist, Craig Winchittle, began rehearsing. On Tuesday, the staff, most of whom have never played handbells and some of whom don't read music, went to the bell room where, with equal parts encouragement and patience, Craig led us in ringing, Jesus loves me. <laughs> it was not by any means a stellar performance, but it was nevertheless absolutely magical. Now, I know that ringing bells might not be everyone's cup of tea, but let me tell you this. The experience of standing in that room surrounded by bells ringing out, Jesus loves me, and being enveloped by and enfolded into the music made me think, maybe this is what it was like, as the composer's brother said, to listen from the inside, to experience the wonder and the awe of it all from a place within. Today is Trinity Sunday. This is the day each year that the church turns its attention to the complex doctrine of the Trinity, God, the three in one, the one in three. Scholars and theologians, and I hasten to add every parish pastor who has ever been called upon to preach on this day, have attempted to come up with a way to make sense of and explain the Trinity. That is, to say clearly, what it is that we mean when we speak of God as three in one. There have been numerous analogies. You've probably heard many of them. The Trinity is like an egg. There's the shell and the white and the yolk, three parts, but one egg. Or the Trinity is like water, liquid, solid, and gas, three states, but just one thing. Or the Trinity is like a tree roots and trunk and branches, three parts, but just one tree. There have also been diagrams drawn in both simple and complex forms in an attempt to explain the relationship between the three persons while maintaining the oneness of God. And over the centuries, 
volumes and volumes have been written about the doctrine. Here's an excerpt from one such attempt to summarize the Trinity. God is three persons and one being. God is one and yet three. The Father is not the Son or the Spirit. The Son is not the Father or the Son, and the Spirit is not the Father or the Son, but the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all God, and God is one. Whew. No wonder it has been said that the Trinity is hard to understand and impossible to explain. In the year 1215, at a meeting of the leadership of the church, it was agreed that whatever we say about God can, at best, be true, but never will it be the whole truth. In other words, our best explanations and descriptions of God can never be anything more than approximations of who God is. We cannot by human reason or understanding, adequately capture the mystery and the wonder and the awe of the creator of the universe. Our vocabulary is limited, and so are our imaginations. This, I believe, is exactly what Jesus was getting at when he said to his disciples in the gospel we read today, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them right now. To be sure, <laughs> God is beyond our full knowing and understanding. God is bigger than what we can carry or hold. God is more than anything we might construct or imagine God to be. The Trinity is beyond our words, but, and this is important, it is not beyond our experience. And maybe that is just as it should be. The first reading for today was from the book of Psalms. Psalm 8 was written by David long before he was king, back when he was tending sheep. You can imagine the shepherd boy having safely settled the sheep for the night and then lying down himself and gazing up at the expansive sky above him and becoming completely overwhelmed by the wonder and the beauty of it all. And so it is that the psalm both begins and ends with these words, O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's important to note, David does not attempt to explain or to reason his way through the mystery, the awe, and the wonder of what it is that he sees. Rather, he simply allows himself to experience it. And then he gives voice to that experience with a hymn of praise. David, you understand, has been enveloped and enfolded into the beauty of God that surrounded him. And all he can say is, how majestic is your name? Writing of the things of this life that escape words, a parish pastor said, the most profound, meaningful, and life-changing things and events of our lives are beyond words, beyond description, and even beyond our understanding. And so, therefore, we do not explain them. We participate in them. And so it is with God. Our worship always begins in the name of the Trinity. Our worship always concludes with a Trinitarian blessing. And in between, the Trinity is named repeatedly in the hymns and the prayers and the readings and the sermons. It's named in the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. It's visualized as we make the sign of the cross every single time we hear the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I hope you see, when we gather for worship, we are enveloped, enfolded into, and surrounded by the presence of our triune God. Trinity Sunday reminds us that as Christians, our entire existence is lived in the presence of the three in one. So whether we're in church or outside under the canopy of the night sky, or anywhere else at all. It's very much like taking your place behind the second violins, 
where you experience from the inside what it is to be enveloped and folded into and surrounded by the grace, the love, and the communion of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.